night um, because Obama would be president as opposed to their guy McCain. So it's, it's ridiculous. I wanted to go back to Ambassador Ruddy. Uh, Stephen Zunis wrote an interesting piece called African Dictatorships and Double Standards, uh, where he talked about the power the United States has over uh, Equatorial Guinea, as opposed, for example, to Zimbabwe. Um, he uh, first talks about the oil companies um, and said, though the Chinese have also recently begun investing in the country's oil sector, U.S. companies ExxonMobil, um, Amarada Hess, Chevron Texco, Marathon Oil have played the most significant role. A uh, report by the International Monetary Fund notes U.S. oil companies received by far the most generous tax and profit sharing provisions in the region. Um, congressional hearings recently revealed how U.S. oil companies paid hundreds of millions of dollars destined to state treasuries directly into the, direct, the dictator's private bank accounts. A Senate report faulted U.S. oil companies for making substantial payments to or entering into business ventures with government officials and their family members. And he goes on to say the irony of the relative silence of Congress and the Bush administration regarding the human rights abuses and undemocratic nature of Obiang's regime is that due to the critical role of U.S. economic investment and security assistance, the U.S. has far more leverage over the government of Equatorial Guinea than it does over Zimbabwe. And he talks about how Equatorial Guinea receives U.S. government funding and training through IMET, which is International Military Education and Training Program. In addition, the Private U.S. firm Military Professional Resources Incorporated, MPRI, founded by former senior Pentagon officials who cite the regime's friendliness to U.S. strategic and economic interests, plays a key role in the country's internal security apparatus. What can the Bush administration do, given the amount of money and Congress that is going into directly from the United States at Equatorial Guinea? Well, I just have to bring up <clears throat> a little anecdote. Uh, when I was there, we had provided the U.S. Uh, Navy had provided the government of Equatorial Guinea with a patrol boat, which they actually needed because there were so many islands there. Uh, the very first act that they committed with that patrol boat uh, that we gave them within a day was an act of piracy on the high seas. So that kind of gives you a flavor for the kind of government you're dealing with there. Uh, yes, we do have, uh, we, we do certainly have a lot of leverage with them in one sense in terms of the money that uh, has been invested there and the controls that we have with various programs. On the other hand, <clears throat> to some degree, it's a seller's market. Uh, there's a lot, there are a lot of countries that are vying for that oil. The, the Chinese, for example, uh, are very interested in the oil in Equatorial Guinea, and, um, and they're not the only country. So that uh, we have to be aware, and I think that's one of the military concerns that uh, this country has, is that we have to be aware of uh, who else is looking for that oil and who else is going to use it and what happens if, uh, if they do get that oil. So that uh, the leverage is not simply the, the kind of leverage we have it's, uh, in an ordinary uh, country in a, in a non-crisis situation. But with the oil crisis around the world today, uh, it's not, it, we, we can cut off certain programs, we can do this and we can do that. But the point is they're able to kind of cock a snook at us and say, well, uh, you know, if you want to do that, we have other people that can fill in and take your place very quickly. So it's not quite uh, the, uh, the leverage it might seem to be by just looking at our programs themselves. And, Ambassador, in terms of these mercenary efforts uh, that, that have a, a, attempts to overthrow Obion, uh, any sense on your part where these are coming from, who is financing these efforts? Well, if you read that, I don't know if you read that book, The Wanga Coup, written by that fellow, I think, from... Uh, the Economist, uh, about this late, most recent coup. Uh, unfortunately, in that case, you didn't have a, uh, a coup based on uh, human rights or trying to set the situation right. You had a coup set on people who wanted to uh, uh, get control of that oil themselves. Uh, unfortunately, the poor fellow that was in the middle that they would have set up as the president, this fellow, Severo Moto, is actually a decent guy. Uh, he probably would have... Uh, been killed within a short time once he once they accomplished their aims, but in terms of a uh, uh, <clears throat> in terms of a a movement on the part of the people, uh, there hasn't there really hasn't been a, a, an effective one. Uh, there's a fellow named uh, uh, Adolfo Obiang Bico, no relation to the president, uh, who uh, uh, had tried, who was thinking about something and got himself arrested in Gabon. Some of his people got were over there murdered, raped, and mutilated. Uh, but there, there, believe it or not, there is not within the country itself 
the kind of grassroots dissatisfaction uh, that kind of leads to uh, leads to a revolution. Um, and I think one of the reasons is that Ken alluded to uh, the predecessor of Obiang, his uncle, uh, who used to hold mass uh, slaughters in the soccer stadium, uh, accompanied to music of the Beatles. So uh, this is a country that has faced terrible, terrible uh, reprisals. It's kind of a poor man's Idi Amin in terms of uh, he was, the, the uncle was a poor, poor man's Idi Amin. And so the country has this uh, history of just such terrible killings and murders and mutilations that uh, it seems to me that you just, until that sort of thing is forgotten and new leadership comes in, I just don't see any, uh, any strong movement in terms of revolution or getting rid of this awful government. Ken Silverstein, finally, the role of uh, the former prime minister of Britain, Margaret Thatcher's son, Sir Mark Thatcher, in the attempted coup. Well, he was... He was implicated in the coup as one of the financiers. I, I am embarrassed to say, and maybe you can fill it, fill this in. I don't recall whether he was actually. I know he was charged. I don't recall whether he was ever convicted. Nobody's ever really been pieced together exactly what happened and put together a list of exactly who was behind this coup. I mean, we do know that um, Severo Moto, the man that Frank alluded to, who I had met once. I traveled to Equat Equatorial Guinea a few years ago and stopped in Spain and met. With um, with Severo Moto, I mean, we know that he was meant to be uh, put in as head of the the country, and I must say, uh, would have been a far better man than the current president. But in terms of, I mean, there have been a lot of allegations made about who funded the coup, but I don't believe anybody's ever been convicted. And maybe Frank, you can correct me if I'm wrong, or, or Amy or Juan. I don't know for certain. I I know Thatcher's son was was implicated. I don't know whether he was ever convicted. Ambassador Reddy. Uh, according again, I'm not the great authority on that because it happened after I had left. But uh, I did read that Wanga coup, which is sort of interesting. It's a potboiler put together uh, in a short period on this particular coup. Uh, but I think what uh, uh, I think Thatcher was uh, charged, money was paid, and he was released. Uh, he was living, I think, in either South. I think it was South Africa, mm -hmm. and uh, money was paid. And I think he has been. Um, you know, sort of that Scottish verdict where they say not proved or something like that, as opposed to acquitted. Uh, but I think he's off the hook. Uh, and was there another part to your question? No, that was it. And I want to thank you both very much for being with us. Um, I know, Ken Silverstein, you have to go. And Frank Ruddy, you're going on a trip. Frank Ruddy, former ambassador to Equatorial Guinea under uh, former President Ronald Reagan. Ken Silverstein, Washington editor of Harper's Magazine, publishes a blog on political corruption in Washington, D.C., called Washington Babylon. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. When we come back, the longest walk. We'll speak with the uh, co-founder of the American Indian Movement, Dennis Banks. Stay with us. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Well, 30 years ago, some 40,000 Native Americans and their supporters participated in a historic cross-country cross march called the Longest Walk. They marched from San Francisco to Washington, D.C., to protest congressional legislation that would have abrogated treaties protecting Native American sovereignty. 